This is Susan Swatsky. Uh, she comes here from Canada. She's going to give her own bio. She has it in uh, presentation. But she's here to talk about fatigue management. She also specializes in stress management. Um, there will be some question and answers afterwards, so feel free to ask her anything that um, may relate to fatigue or stress management afterwards. Great. So welcome, yeah. Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the slight delay getting started. We are on our third computer getting the presentation loaded, so it was a little stress management this morning, but uh, I think we're all right now. Oh, thank you. There we go. How's that? Good? Okay, perfect. And I'm not... That'll be all right if my arm's there? Good. All right. Um, so I thought I would start off by just telling you a little bit about myself uh, and my background. Um, my name is uh, Susan Sawatsky, and uh, I'm owner of InScope Solutions, which is a health and safety consulting company that specializes in fatigue and stress management. Um, I am an instructor with the University of Calgary and the University of New Brunswick. Uh, I instruct in their... Um, uh, health and safety programs. I instruct uh, fatigue management, stress management, psychological health and safety, as well as some other courses like business leadership and uh, management systems. Um, I do speak uh, at a variety of conferences and I present mostly to uh, health and safety professionals and HR professionals, helping them to understand how to help organizations in terms of managing fatigue and stress in the work. With a large number of organizations um, such as yourselves where I get to go out and talk to a variety of people about managing fatigue in the workplace and managing stress factors. Another part of my work that I greatly enjoy is uh, I get to do a lot of field work. I work a great deal with the oil and gas industry. I help them develop guidelines and policies in terms of managing fatigue throughout the industry. Uh, and I also go to a lot of sites um, I work in mining as well as oil and gas. I work in, um, uh, I've worked with fisheries and, and retail locations all across a variety of industry groups, helping them to understand fatigue and stress. Some of the work that I do is I'll go out to a work site and really do a fatigue risk analysis. So take a look at the tasks that are being done and the schedules that are being kept and give feedback on the type of risk that they're, uh, they're developing. And some recent work that I've done uh, in the province that I'm from, Alberta, back in Canada, um, I recently drafted some legislation that's being proposed uh, with regards to fatigue management. And if passed, it will be the first broad industry fatigue legislation that's being passed in North America. So it could be a real game changer in terms of looking at fatigue and fatigue management in the workplace. So that's sort of the quick bio, uh, a little bit about where I come from and, and the work that I do. And I thought I would just share forward um, some of what I wanted to talk about today. So we're going to be looking at fatigue management. Um, and we'll start off by talking about the issue. So why fatigue is an issue in the workplace, why we're worried about it in the first place. And we'll take a look at it in terms of safety and in terms of health. And then I'll give you some background information that's really useful in terms of understanding fatigue. So we'll talk about things like circadian rhythms and sleep cycles. And we'll look at some of the barriers that come to managing fatigue in the workplace, as well as some of the assessment that can be done, um, different ways that you can assess fatigue and recognize what level you're at. And finally, we'll look at strategies that can be used to manage fatigue. And I'll talk about strategies in terms of organizational strategies, uh, strategies you can use when you're working as a team, and strategies you can use just for yourself, personal strategies when managing fatigue. And I want to start off by asking, um, what is workplace fatigue to you? So just think for a minute, how does fatigue impact your life in terms of your work? And when does it sort of um, become an issue? And then I'll ask for someone to maybe share forward uh, a couple of examples. <laughs> this morning when I'm trying to wake up? <clears throat> I would say the most challenging part of our job tends to be with field work. Um, particularly, there have been field projects where we've had to um, essentially change our shift frequently and so we're working a couple nights and then we're off and then we're back on a day shift or whatever um, and um, particularly when you couple that with say driving an hour to a field site or something. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and I think field work creates its own situation because it's not work that you're, no, that'll, I'll get you in one sec. It's not work that you're used to doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It's one of those sort of uh, high times and low times in terms of scheduling, I would bet. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You lost your mic, though. <laughs> this gentleman in front here, yeah. I would I would I would add to that <clears throat> in the in the normal here at at, at work uh, the protracted number of 10 12 hour days over weeks on end to meet some vacuous deadline or other requirement uh, also tends to uh, wear on you pretty pretty substantially yeah and, and I think there are significant uh, significant issues with that in, in in our situation in particular excellent. Good. So hopefully I'll be able to address both of those situations as we go through. And feel free to give me feedback at the end if I don't sort of cover everything that, that will help with those as well as other places where fatigue really enters in. Yeah. Susan, I'd like to comment too. Uh, I see fatigue increasing the stress level. When you get fatigued, you start prioritizing, what am I going to finish tonight before I go to bed? When does this actually do? And then what happens is it, it builds on your fatigue because you start pushing things off and it might take longer. And I, I think when I've gone out on field campaigns on the safety side, I'm up till maybe sleeping three or four hours a night, three days before you deploy. And then I'm going into an environment where I know I, I don't have a shift change, so I want to catch all the shifts. So I, I go into the environment already fatigued. So I... I would bet most of the people in here could probably relate to that a little bit too, you know, getting their equipment going right before they deploy and then they go to the environment a little fatigued. Yeah, and, and there is a, a, a strong interrelationship between stress and fatigue, um, and I'll, I'll touch on the stress factor a little bit as we go through, and I think that idea of we don't always start off the day, you know, bright and ready to go, um, often we bring our fatigue with us when we show up in the morning because, you know, we've had a lot of other things going on or we've been working a lot of hours before we started that day. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's some really good points, and, and uh, hopefully we'll encompass all of those as, as we move through the presentation. Um, fatigue has an impact on our safety and one of the things that we really worry about fatigue in the workplace is how it can impact our safety. Um, when you look at fatigue and we look at some of the occupational research that's been done, fatigue is usually listed in the top five causes of worker error and worker error is considered to be a contributing factor in 80 to 90 percent of workplace incidents. Going past 12 hours uh, has about a 28% increased risk in having an incident in the workplace. Working more than 50 hours a week um, doubles our risk of making an error and also has a huge impact on our productivity. Fatigue tends to increase our errors. Um, and this, this uh, one point is a, a compilation of several studies, but approximately 20% of pilots, 18% of uh, train engineers, 14% of truck drivers, 30% of nurses, and 57% of workers in manufacturing all admit to making significant workplace errors due to fatigue. And I think this last uh, statistic is really relevant in terms of where we are in managing fatigue in the workplace. And that is fatigue is four times more likely to contribute to workplace impairment than drugs or alcohol. And it's simply because we're better at managing drugs and alcohol in the workplace. We acknowledge it. We, we recognize it. Um, and also, fatigue is just more common. We all can relate to fatigue and fatigue issues. When we look at defining fatigue, um, we can recognize that, uh, yeah, some of us feel like that some mornings, don't we? <laughs> fatigue is really reduced mental or physical performance capacities. So recognizing that it impacts, impacts us in both areas. We also know that it results from work as well as other factors. And the reason we really worry about it is that it can impair our abilities. It impairs our abilities and our alertness to safely perform work that we're doing. So let's start off by taking a driving test. I'm going to ask you a question, and then I'm going to compare you to the national average and see how you do, OK? So first question, in the past year, have you ever driven while feeling very tired? Yeah. Forced to by work. <laughs> there we go. And national average, 54%. So you guys are a little above average, but. We, 
we've always viewed ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. You knew that coming in, didn't you? <laughs> uh, have you in the past year driven while you were so sleepy you had a hard time keeping your eyes open? Where are we at? Okay. All right. A little bit fewer. Uh, national average, 27%. And finally, the big question, in the past year, have you actually fallen asleep at the wheel? Nobody. All right. That's impressive. National average, 20%, which I think is a little bit terrifying. So let me ask you, which is worse when it comes to driving? Would you say drunk or tired? What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, and it does. It depends on the dose, right? You know, all the poison is always in the dose. But if we take someone who is legally impaired and take someone who is exhausted, they actually show on driving courses, the person who's very tired does worse. And it makes a lot of sense when we take a look at this study. This is one of the most significant studies that's been done looking at fatigue and fatigue in the workplace was first done back in 1997, but it's been replicated a few times since then. And basically what these researchers did is they took 40 individuals and they divided them into two groups. And the first group they gave measured amounts of alcohol to and just measured their blood alcohol levels. And the second group they kept them awake for 28 hours. And both groups they gave a series of mental and physical performance tasks and they just measured their, their uh, level of impairment. And what they found was really surprising. At only 17 hours awake, we perform at the same level of impairment as someone with a blood alcohol level of 0.05. At 21 hours awake, we perform at the same level of impairment as someone who is at the legal limit with a blood alcohol level of 0.08. And at 24 hours awake, we are performing the same as someone who has a blood alcohol level of 0.10, which is well over the legal limit. And it has huge implications in the workplace because, you know, we would never dream of showing up for work legally intoxicated. But we don't always have that same understanding if we show up and we're just exhausted. Fatigue also is a real safety issue when we look at motor vehicle incidents. Um, fatigue is considered to cause approximately 20% of all vehicle fatalities. Now, it's very high in terms of vehicle fatalities because we don't break when we're asleep, right? Even if we're intoxicated, we'll see something, we'll attempt to break at the end. But we don't break if we're actually asleep. It's only under alcohol in terms of single largest cause for vehicle fatalities. Another study that really um, helps us to understand why fatigue is a safety issue is one that was done in 2010 uh, and this study looked at about 75,000 uh, workers across the United States. It was a massive study. Um, it looked broad industry, it looked you know, geographically, different age demographics. And what they found when they were comparing health data to workplace incidents is that when we were getting between seven to nine hours sleep, we had fairly low, very consistent incident rates, somewhere around 2%. But when we started to get less sleep, when we were getting around six, five, or under five, our, our workplace incidents climbed steadily until there were about a 400% increase sitting at around 8% when we were under five hours sleep. The interesting part of this study is that they also noticed that people who were getting over 10 hours sleep were also having increased risks of incidence. And some of that, uh, they went back and looked at the health data, some of that um, was based on the fact that a lot of these individuals had sleep issues or health issues that were causing them to get the longer amount of sleep but more than likely still be fatigued. Fatigue tends to impact us in waves. So when we first start to become very tired, it tends to impact us in terms of our emotional capabilities. We start to get a little bit of moody and maybe irritable. Um, we might be impulsive or make irrational decisions. Um, sometimes we're just very unmotivated or some people get a little bit giddy when they're overtired. If we aren't able to manage our fatigue at that point, it moves into our next level, which is beginning to impact our mental abilities. So we start to have difficulty with things like problem solving and decision making. Our attention tends to wane, we have a hard time concentrating, um, our memory isn't working, we, have, we are often very forgetful, 
And we can even have trouble sort of thinking those words that we need at the time and being able to communicate. And finally, if we aren't able to manage our fatigue when it starts impacting our mental abilities, it moves into impacting us in terms of our physical abilities. We'll get things like that blurry vision and headache. Um, it'll have an impact on our hand-eye coordination, our reaction time, and gross motor coordination. And, and you know, you'll even start to do that losing your balance, staggering a little bit when you're really exhausted. <clears throat> And the worst of the worst, when fatigue has its biggest impact on us in terms of safety, is when we experience something called the microsleep, which is that two to 60 second unplanned nap. You know, many of us call it kind of that chicken head, like, oh, I didn't mean to fall asleep. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit funny if someone does it, you know, after having the big uh, Thanksgiving dinner, but it's not so funny if we do it when we're doing something very safety sensitive like driving. And all of those things, both our emotional capacities, mental capacities, and physical capacities, um, influence our capacity to be able to work safely. So I'm going to just give you a minute to think about it. Has it happened to you? Has there been a time in the field, in the workplace, that you can think when fatigue has actually impacted your safety? safety? And maybe it was one of those near misses, one of those, oh, I, I kind of gave me my wake-up call at the time. Does anybody have a story they want to share? Anybody feeling brave? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I can share forward one if you want. Um, with the work that I do, I travel an insane amount. Um, I was telling Bob earlier, I'm home, like, I think six days this entire month. Uh, and a lot of the work that I do is flying, but a lot of the work that I do is also driving. And uh, I was doing some work at a mining uh, company maybe about six or eight months ago. And as a fatigue management person, of all people, I really should know better. But I worked all day on field site, and then I took the flight back that night, sort of anticipating that I'd be able to get some sleep on the flights, and just, I don't know, whatever came, I really wasn't able to. Got to my car at two in the morning, and, you know, had thought, well, if I'm tired, I'm going to, you know, book a hotel. And then just decided, no, I just really want to get home. And bad decision, and I knew it was a bad decision, but I don't know, sometimes we're a little bit irrational when we're overtired. And I decided to push through. And, of course, I didn't get maybe, I don't know, uh, half an hour away from the airport, and it started to snow. So you've got the snow coming down, and you're tired, and you're driving, and, and I was a little bit nervous even to pull over and have a rest because I thought with the snow I'd be much more difficult to see pulled over to the side of the road. And it was one of those that, you know, I made it home safely, obviously I'm here in one piece, but it was one of those that was honestly one of the most difficult drives I've had. I could feel myself getting tired, I knew my car was wandering over the line. I was very lucky it was late at night and there was no wildlife. It was one of those decisions that I really knew fatigue was impacting my safety and very much regretted the decision. All right, we've taken a look at fatigue in terms of safety and I just shared forward a few studies that talk about it. We do recognize that fatigue can have an impact on our safety. I wanted to spend a couple minutes and talk about fatigue and our health. When we look at our overall health, there's really three pillars that influence how we are in terms of our overall health. And the first, of course, is nutrition. And we know a lot about nutrition. We know the kinds of foods we should be eating. We know when we should be eating and those types of things. The second important pillar is exercise. And again, we know a great deal about exercise. We know the types of exercises we should be doing and how often we should be doing them and why they're important to our overall health. But the third pillar in that equation really is sleep. And sleep is one of those things that we're not as informed about. We don't know as much about sleep as we do about the other two. So let me ask you, and you guys are gonna know this. True or false, human body can live longer without food than it can without sleep. What do you think? True. Yeah, very true. Uh, in fact, world record holder for going without sleep 11 days and when you look it was part of a, it was actually a science fair project yeah a high school science fair project this guy stayed awake for 11 days fully documented he was completely psychotic at the end of 11 days 
Yeah. Um, but food, you know, people have been recorded on hunger strikes for four, even up to six weeks at a time. So it's quite a big difference. In terms of our overall basic needs, sleep is pretty critical. So why do we sleep? Um, one of those age-old questions that we've never 100% been able to answer, but more and more, and this research is really recent, um, we're beginning to understand the true function of sleep. And really, um, our brain is only about 10% of our body mass, but it consumes about 25% of our overall energy use. And what they're realizing is that, of course, our brain has no lymphatic system. So it has no ability to naturally clear out the cellular waste. What they're realizing is that when we sleep, that's when our cerebral spinal fluid um, clears out a lot of that cellular waste. We, our, our brains tend to be a system that will wait and allow everything to, to build up, and then at night, clear everything out. Um, a lot of our important uh, synaptic connections are strengthened in sleep. We also know that increased learning uh, during the day leads to increased brain activity when we sleep. So we have a lot more REM sleep and a lot more brain activity going on if we do a great deal of learning during the day. Um, any of you who have ever sort of really been mentally intensive during a day, which I'm guessing happens lots when you're really focused on something and really sort of engaging your mind, you notice you tend to be a lot more tired at the end of that day, even though you haven't been physically active. And it's because your body's using up that, that store of energy. Um, we know for a fact that um, sleep is really necessary in terms of our overall mental and physical functioning. Harvard did some great studies where they looked at sleep and how sleep has an impact on our learning. So some of the studies they did, they would teach students a certain um, complex task, test them about an hour after they'd been taught, and then let them have a good night's sleep and test them the next morning. And they found that good night's sleep was really important for consolidating some of the, the information. And they often did better the next day than they did originally after they'd learned the information. Um, it also had an impact when they would take two, uh, two groups, give one group, give both groups the information, allow one group to take a short nap, and have the other group just busy doing tasks. And they found the group that was able to take a short nap also tended to do better in the learning tasks. Sleep also has an impact on our uh, overall mental health. Almost every major form of mental illness <coughs> has some form of sleep issue associated with it. And you know, there's, there's no evidence in terms of what causes what, but every major, sleep, uh, every major mental illness does have some sleep issue. They note that shift workers and people who are chronically deprived of sleep tend to have higher incidence in terms of depression. And when they do twin studies, um, they note that if one individual has uh, a lot of difficulty with sleeping, they also have a much higher rate of depression. And sleep impacts our immunity. Um, when we're sleeping too much, we're more likely to get sick. It takes us longer to get better. Um, anybody here ever had the experience where you know you get really run down, you get really tired, and that's when you get the cold or the flu or the yeah, whatever comes around. Okay, here's one for you. True or false, fatigue makes you fat. True, true. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is surprisingly true. And a lot of that evidence has really just come out in the last few years. Again, it's very recent understandings. Um, some of the research that's come out to show that... <laughs> uh, it really comes down to our blood sugar levels. When we're not getting enough sleep, we're not regulating our blood sugar levels. Um, they become highly irregular, and especially when we're sleeping outside of regular daytime hours, so when you're working the late nights. Our blood sugars are very regular, which has a huge impact on how we're metabolizing our food. They also note that when we don't get enough sleep, we tend to be extra hungry the next day. Um, and not only are we extra hungry, we're craving more food and we're craving those high carbohydrate foods. And the thinking behind that is really it's our body's way of trying to make up for the energy that we're not getting because we didn't get enough sleep. And the overall result, if you are a person who is chronically fatigued, and not chronic fatigue, but regularly not getting enough rest, um, you tend to be on average uh, men 20 to 25 pounds heavier and women 18 to 22 pounds heavier than the average population. Fatigue also has some serious impacts on other parts of our health. 
Um, those, and this is done by studying a lot of shift work populations because by definition they tend to be very regularly fatigued. Uh, they have about a 15% increased risk of stroke, 40% uh, increased risk in terms of cardiovascular disease, increase in multiple types of cancer. In fact, the International Agency for Research on Cancer lists fatigue when it comes to operating outside of our regular daytime uh, rhythms as a type 2A carcinogen, which means a probable cause of cancer. Fatigue is linked to all kinds of memory issues, concentration issues, of course that brain fog when you just can't seem to remember and think clearly, increase in peptic ulcers, and increase in hypertension. All right, so we've done the first quarter of the hour on the clock, and um, we've taken a good look at fatigue in terms of safety, fatigue in terms of health. Um, I want to now move forward and just give a little bit of background information, um, recognizing some of this may be familiar to you, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when it comes to understanding fatigue and when it comes to managing fatigue, there's some background pieces that are really useful uh, to understand. And we'll start off by taking a sleep test to find out if you're getting enough sleep. So are you ready? Okay. I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and just think in your head yes or no. So first question, do you need an alarm clock to wake up in the morning? Do you set it just, you know, for security's sake or is that what actually wakes you up in the morning? Can you give me a, all right. Does it take you a while to get out of bed? Do you tell yourself that eternal lie, five more minutes, just five more minutes? <laughs> Do you sleep longer on your days off? Oh, I'm surprised actually. Normally a lot of people, that's the one, sleep in longer on the Saturday or the Sunday. <coughs> Are you often drowsy at work? Or only when you're getting a fatigue presentation then you're extra drowsy. <laughs> Are you moody at work? Yeah? Should I ask co-workers? <laughs> Do you need lots of stimulants? Do you need that caffeine to get yourself through the day? All right. Uh, do you perform tasks on autopilot? Do you do that drive home at the end of the day and pull in the driveway and go, oh, I actually don't remember anything <laughs> in terms of getting me here? A couple, a few people. All right. And this is the big one. Do you fall asleep often whenever you are in a comfortable place? Are you the type of person who has not seen a good movie for the past year because every time you sit down, you can't make it to the end? No? All right. <laughs> um, if you answered yes to any of the first, uh, what are we, two, four, six, seven questions, um, you're probably a little bit sleep deprived. You probably have a bit of a sleep debt that you're building up. If you answered yes to that last question, you're really sleep deprived. In fact, you may even have a sleep disorder or something like that going on. Um, probably should get that checked out. If you fall asleep every time you sit in a nice, warm, comfortable place, you're really sleep deprived. One of the things that's really useful in terms of understanding sleep and managing our sleep when we get into the strategies piece at the end is recognizing sleep cycles. Now, this understanding came about back in the 1960s when researchers started hooking up electroencephalographs to people's brains and just measuring the brain waves that we naturally give off. And they used that to try and figure out what it is we do when we're asleep. And they figured out we go through five basic uh, stages when we sleep. Stage one and two are our light stages of sleep. If you get woken up from a stage one or two sleep, you're going to wake up right away, you're going to be pretty alert, you might not even be 100% sure that you've actually been asleep. Stage one and two are theta waves, and in essence, they tend to restore us our alertness and tend to restore our mental abilities. From there, we move into the deeper stages of sleep. We go into stage three and stage four sleep. Now, stage three and four are delta waves of sleep. If you get woken up from a stage three or four sleep, you're going to feel awful. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to have that achy, ugh, I just feel terrible. You're going to have a really hard time waking up. The fifth stage of sleep is one that most people have heard of. It's your REM, your rapid eye movement, your dream sleep. Dream sleep is called spindle sleep. 
our heart rate goes up, our, our brain speed increases. And we're really recognizing that dream sleep is when we're consolidating those memories and improving our learning capacities. Now, we move through those stages of sleep in a complete sleep cycle. And the sleep cycle takes between 90 to 120 minutes. Uh, in fact, when we first fall asleep, we tend to be around the 90 minute range. As the night goes, our sleep cycles get longer and longer until just before you wake up, you're at around 120 minutes. We also tend to get more stage three sleep and stage four sleep as we go through the night and our dreams increase closer to the morning. Now, the reason for that, the takeaway, the why that's important information, is really it, it shows us that both quantity and quality of sleep are really important in terms of how it's able to restore us. If we're having an interrupted sleep, for example, we're not going to be moving into those stage three and four sleeps, um, and we're not going to feel as restored from our sleep, even if we're getting that seven to eight hours. The other reason that that's important is it shows us that day sleep is harder. Day sleep is different. When we sleep during the day because we're working during the night, we can't get a full night's sleep. Um, we tend to only be able to get between five to six hours at a stretch. Um, day sleep has different cycles. We don't have as much <coughs> stage three and four. We may not dream as much. Um, day sleep, of course, has all of those lovely things like light and noise and things to interrupt us. Um, day sleep, almost by definition, leads to sleep debt. And it's the reason we're always very careful in terms of how many nights in a row we let people work because almost by definition, if you're up nights sleeping days, you're developing a sleep debt. Day sleepers need naps, and they should have napping as part of their strategy if you are working nights. The other thing that's really useful in terms of understanding um, sleep and sleep strategies is circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms are any of our body rhythms that run on that approximately 24-hour cycle. And our circadian rhythms are, are regulated by light and light cues. Our circadian rhythms influence a large number of our body systems. Um, our body temperature and blood pressure, our heart rate, uh, our blood sugars, our digestive enzymes, and a lot of the hormones that we produce run on this 24-hour schedule. Those body systems, of course, have a huge impact on us. They impact our memory and our reaction time. They'll have an impact on our behavior, our, excuse me, our <coughs> emotional stability, our physical coordination, as well as our ability to be alert and make decisions and learn things. Now, our circadian rhythms run in a pretty set cycle. If you're a morning person, you're going to be a little bit more to that end of the graph. And if you're an evening person or a night owl, you're going to be a little bit more to this end of the graph. But in essence, this is what a typical person's circadian rhythms look like. And what this means is sometime around 7 o'clock in the morning till around 10 o'clock at night, all of our body systems start functioning at full capacity. And they're designed to keep us alert and awake and aware of what's going on in our environment. You'll notice a little dip that occurs between 1 to 3 in the afternoon. How many people notice that little dip that occurs <laughs> between 1 to 3 in the afternoon? Absolutely. You know, get up, get a cup of coffee, move around. The brain's not working so well. But other than that, for the most part, during the day, our bodies are designed to keep us alert and have us be awake. Sometime around 10 o'clock, until approximately six in the morning, all of that shifts. And our bodies and our body systems are designed to put us to sleep. So to have us be less aware of what's going on, have us be less capable, have us be less alert. Now, it's not to say that we can't do work at three o'clock in the morning. We know we can, we've done it. But it's recognizing that we're really fighting our basic biology to be able to do that. And we're probably not as capable as we would be at other times during the day. Putting that all in perspective, kind of bringing it together, when we're trying to do work at 2 o'clock in the morning, our heart rate is going to be a little bit lower. Our blood pressure is going to be a little bit lower. If we try and eat food, our digestive enzymes aren't going to function as well, and our blood sugars are, going to likely, to, are likely to be very irregular, which will influence our mood and how we're feeling overall. Um, and of course, we have uh, neurochemicals and hormones that are slowing down how fast our neurotransmitters can transmit that information we're not going to be able to think as clearly. 
The other way that circadian rhythms are important to us uh, is when we live in winter climates, especially when we live in you know circumpolar regions where we've got the short winter days and the long summer days, because our light cues are affected. And so even though our circadians run on basically a 24-hour schedule, they use those light cues to be able to reset themselves. So how many people notice sometime around November now till around February, March, you're just that little bit more tired? That's actually, oh yeah, a little higher than normal. About 20% of the population is really affected by that. And we actually become more and more affected as we get older. So what's happening is in essence, you're not getting those light cues to reset your circadians. And without that sort of hard reset, they tend to drift a little bit, which leaves you just feeling half tired all the time. Does that be helped by doing more physical activity <coughs> during the daylight hours? Yes and no. Um, during more physical activity during the day will help you sleep better at night, which will help you sort of stay on a regular cycle. But if you give me one second, I'm, uh, there is something that will really help in terms of resetting your circadians. Um, oh, the other place that, that circadians impact is when you're traveling, right? When you're going around the globe, when you're switching time zones, again, you're sort of going against your circadians because you're moving to new time zones. It takes a while for them to adjust to the new time zone. And back to your point, which was a really good question. Um, one of the things that you can do that will help reset your circadians is give them the light cues that they're not getting. So there is blue spectrum light you can get. Uh, it comes as an alarm clock. It comes as... Uh, you know, a light box. I've, I've seen them called like a happy light or SADS light for seasonal affective disorder, um, glow light, daylight. They're called by uh, lots of different names. You can pick them up at pretty much any drugstore or department store. Um, and what you want to do with those lights is you want to have your eye exposed to it for about 20 minutes within your first hour of getting up. So you don't want to look directly at it. They tend to give you a headache. So just have it off to the side, maybe when you're you know, eating your breakfast or getting ready or whatever you want to do. And only for about 20 minutes, have that light, have your eye exposed to that light. And what that tends to do is give you a hard reset of your circadians, and it will help a lot with that sort of tired feeling that you get. The other way those lights are really useful is if you are having, uh, on a field assignment, for example, having to work through the night, you can use those lights to help you shift even faster because you want to use them within an hour of whatever your morning is going to be. So if it's six o'clock at night and that's what you want your morning to be, you can use exposure to that light to try and help reset you. Um, the only issue is when you're getting daylight cues from other times, it might not work as effectively. Okay. Did that help with your question? Yeah. The other thing to note is uh, homeostasis. So Basically, that just means that the longer we're awake, the more we want to sleep. The longer we're asleep, the more we want to wake. And it's just that recognition that even if you come in with a good night's sleep, um, in this case, you know, if, when we're awake for a certain amount of hours, eventually our systems will overtake and we'll have that need for sleep creep up. Okay, I'm hoping this is going to work. Sorry, I can't actually see what I'm doing. There we go. Oh, sound! I forgot to check for sound. Is our tech guy gone? <laughs> All right, let me pause. Okay, sorry about that. That was we with all our tech issues. I forgot to do the double check for sound. I do have a few videos, so it would be nice if we can do that. We want to. Can someone maybe grab a light for us just for a second? <coughs> right but no actually it doesn't look right uh, okay let's see oh yep over here so which I think the far one no I think I think the speakers oh wait, sorry okay oh yeah you're right Mike. yeah okay all right let's give this a try let's see if we're lucky what if we just turn the mic up on here? Let's try that. 
can do sound. And there's our light. Yep, there you go. Okay, so let's get volume to its max. I'll give it a shot. Oh, there we go. Okay, so... It won't come through here. Yeah, that's okay. I'll hold the mic up and maybe... Okay. Is it max? Yeah. That's max volume? Yep. Okay. All right, guys, we're going to give this a shot. Hopefully, tech will be our friend. Just going to restart it. Tired? We all know the feeling. Irritable, groggy, no? and exceptionally yeah. lazy. Chances are you didn't sleep enough last night or the past few nights. But what exactly is enough sleep? And more importantly, can you ever catch up on it? While the very function of sleep is still debated by scientists, we do know that it's necessary to function efficiently and productively. After all, we spend 24 years of our lifetime sleeping, it had better be important. Researchers have tested how much is required each night by assigning groups of people to four, six, and eight hours of sleep over extended periods of time. After 14 days, those with eight hours of sleep exhibited few attention lapses or cognitive issues. However, those with six or four hours of sleep showed a steady decline. In fact, after only two weeks, the six hour group showed a similar reaction time to a person with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.1%, which is considered legally drunk. The four hour sleepers suffered even more, occasionally falling asleep during their cognitive tests. In both groups, brain function decreased day by day almost linearly with no sign of leveling off. Scientists have dubbed this cumulative effect as sleep debt. So can we recover from it? After a night or two of little sleep, studies show that the body and brain can fully recover with a few nights of good sleep. However, with long-term sleep deprivation on the scale of weeks to months, the recovery of cognitive function is much slower, requiring many more nights of quality sleep. On the time scale of months to years, it's unknown whether brain function could be fully repaired or if it causes permanent damage. Par there we go. I thought I'd share that clip. I thought it was a... Hello. Hi. I th are we uh, okay with the sound for the web people? I was a little worried about that. Did you guys get a plug in? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, perfect. I do have a couple more, so... All right. Good. Can you guys still see that okay? I need to test it. Okay. Oh, do we need to test it? Okay. Uh, if you wanted to play later. Sure. Paradoxically, with chronic sleep depth. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks. All right. So we're moving into uh, the next part of our clock. <clears throat> and in essence, what I thought we could take a look at is some barriers that come when we try and manage fatigue in the workplace, uh, as well as some ways to assess fatigue and recognize um, when tired is too tired. So we'll look at some of those roadblocks, and again, we'll talk about when tired is too tired in terms of safety. So when we look at managing fatigue, there are some barriers that exist to be able to manage it effectively. The first is a lack of awareness. Fatigue really isn't recognized as a health and safety issue. People don't often think about it that way. Um, and when you know, we do start to think of it as health and safety, um, we often don't know what strategies are available to be able to manage it. And it's part of our work culture. Um, you know, we just accept being tired as the way it should be. It's our modern living, it's the work that we do. You know, if you're not tired, well, you're probably just not working hard enough. Also, we have a lot of rewards. Um, uh, often we get extra money for working overtime, for working extended hours. Um, and there's that myth of productivity. That idea if we just work longer and longer and longer hours, we're going to get more and more done. But somewhere around 50 hours, our productivity really begins to drop, and we come a little bit self-defeating in terms of our overall abilities to get things done. Um, and I hear this when I work in industry. Often there's the, oh, I think, sorry about that. Uh, often there's the issue of liability. Um, so the idea of somehow if we acknowledge fatigue as a risk, that, and then somehow we're going to be liable for having people work those hours, which is really strange because in almost every other aspect of health and safety, we do acknowledge it and we manage it, but for some reason fatigue is one of those that we don't. There's also a lack of industry data and metrics. Um, I shared forward with you some of the industry research that's available, but there's not a lot of industry specific research that looks at fatigue and fatigue issues in the workplace. 
when companies do incident investigations, um, they often don't have fatigue management built into it. So they're not asking the questions to be able to identify or rule out if fatigue was a contributing causal factor. And when they do recognize that fatigue is an issue, there's not a real centralized ability to be able to report that, to collect that information. And there's a perception issue. Now, I don't know how that impacts you in some of the field work that you're doing. It may or may not be an issue, but you know, if you drive by a work site and you see this guy, what's your thoughts? Sleeping on the job. I, how many people are thinking, oh, great, look, he's managing his fatigue, so he is less of a safety risk, right? Not our first impression. <laughs> yeah, the white hat, yeah. <laughs> when we're looking at trying to assess fatigue um, in the workplace, there are some real factors that we can look at examining. Um, we can look at things like, of course, the scheduling. So that's the first thing we look at. Are we working nights? Are we working 12-hour days? What types of things are occurring? But we also look at the things that we're doing in, that, in the field work. So for example, um, we're going to take a look at the tasks and some of the demands. We recognize that really physically demanding work is going to make us tired. but often some of the tasks that are most, most likely to bring on that feeling of drowsiness are boring and monotonous work. Um, as well as jobs that we have to be 100% paying attention to the whole time that we can't really let our minds completely um, you know, wander away from. And one of the worst of the worst in terms of tasks, the one we really talk about when we're trying to assess the fatigue risks, is driving and commuting. Not only do we tend to drive and commute either at the beginning of our day when we're just kind of waking up or at the end of our day when we're really tired, but it can be very boring and monotonous, especially if you're going long distances, <coughs> and it's one of those that you can't just completely not pay attention to for even a minute. Work environment is another thing to really look at. Um, obviously, extreme temperatures, um, chaotic environments, all of those things are going to bring on fatigue and make you more likely to become tired when you're working. Uh, but again, uh, one of the unusual things is the change in work environment. So for example, if you're working outside and you're fairly active, and then you change environments to maybe a nice, warm, comfortable cab of a vehicle, um, that's often when the drowsiness and the fatigue really hits home. Um, worker factors, so recognizing um, that we're all individuals, we have different levels of health, different age, uh, we all are impacted by fatigue differently, uh, as well as off-duty factors. We don't all show up for work bright-eyed and ready to go first thing in the morning. Uh, I think it was, um, uh, Bob, was it you that mentioned the idea about doing all of the work before you even start the field work, so sort of starting the day uh, already tired. So recognizing that, you know, do you have a sleep disorder? Do you have a new baby? Were you stressed? Were you working late? All of those things will impact how tired you are when you start. And other factors, uh, things like working in other time zones or, or uh, working during the winter. I also want to point out a really important distinction. And this is um, quite important when we talk about strategies to manage fatigue. And that is the difference between drowsy and fatigued. We often use those words interchangeably, but drowsy we can think about as sort of that short term, just feeling a little <coughs> bit sleepy, maybe you're doing something that's not interesting, hopefully it's not listening to a fatigue presentation. Um, but that drowsy feeling that comes over us is normally fairly short term and fairly easy to fix. Fatigued is that longer term, sleep deprived, or being you know, stressed in terms of what's occurring in your environment for a long period of time. And both of those uh, can create fatigue, which is harder to manage. Fatigue will increase your drowsiness, um, and you'll be much more likely to become drowsy, but they need to be managed in different ways. So when we look at assessing fatigue, um, we talked just briefly earlier about assessing fatigue in the actual work that we're doing. Now I want to talk about fatigue assessment in ourselves. So when we can recognize that we ourselves are too tired, or co-workers when you're working in groups. 
There is no scientific test. Um, you know, there is for drugs, there is for alcohol, but in terms of fatigue, there's no perfect, easy, take this test and we know you're tired. So we need to turn to other <coughs> types of methods. One of the methods that can be used to measure fatigue is something called a fatigue likelihood assessment. And it's just basically a quick math that you do uh, looking at your sleep in the previous 24 hours, in the previous 48 hours, as well as how long you've been awake. And it will spit you out what's called a fatigue likelihood score, uh, which is really your likelihood of becoming extremely fatigued or impaired by fatigue during your work that you're doing. And you can link that to decisions. Um, so you can say, for example, on a field project, if someone's fatigue likelihood score is hitting between a 5 to 11, they maybe shouldn't be doing safety sensitive work or we should have someone working with them or watching out for them or making sure that they're going to be okay. And when they hit an over 12, that's it. Like, go get some rest. This, you know, we're done. We need to put that first. You also need to look at your signs. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I was waiting for it. No, definitely not your horoscope signs. Your signs of fatigue. Um, so take a look at your emotional signs. Um, take a look at your mental signs, your physical signs. We know them, right? But having sort of that formal thought to go through them. And this is also really important when you're working with groups because you know, we'd always, we don't always recognize how tired we are when we're getting tired. So it's nice if you've got someone working with you that they can point it out. So when you're in a work environment, pay attention to things like all of a sudden you just can't think clearly or you're starting to get really forgetful, stuff you always kind of remember, now you just got to think about it or maybe go look it up even though I always remember that but now I got to go look it up. You're double checking, did I do that right? Did I get that one down? I forgot. Um, hard time communicating, maybe you just don't want to talk to anybody anymore. Um, oops, I think I shut my thing off here. Um, you don't respond to changes in your environment or, or maybe new information that's coming in. You're struggling to make decisions. Thinking about these types of things that are occurring can help you really assess if you are becoming fatigued. This is also another tool that can be used, uh, the Samparelli Fatigue Checklist. It's basically just a way of saying, I'm getting tired, rating your own tiredness, but giving it a numeric value. And by giving it a numeric value, you can just sort of cross-check it again to decisions that you can make in a work environment or in the field and decide if that's worth proceeding. Okay, so we've looked at the health and safety. We've looked at some of the background. We've taken a look at ways of assessing fatigue and we've talked about some of the barriers. For our last sort of quarter of the hour, so to speak, uh, I wanna take a look at ways that we can manage fatigue. We're gonna take a look at it in three different ways. We're gonna look at workplace strategies in terms of within the organization, um, so really within your field work as well as here. Um, we'll take a look at it in terms of a team environment when you're working with a group, and then we'll take a look at it in terms of strategies you can use to manage your own personal fatigue. And I wanna start off by just stating what I hope is pretty obvious, and that is fatigue is a hazard. It can be a hazard in our work environment, and as a hazard, we can look at it in the way that we look at other hazards in our work. So we can think about it as occurring at the source, traveling along the path, and impacting the worker. Now, if we use that model to think about electrical energy, for example, we can think about um, you know, high energy transformers as being the source of the hazard. We can think about the electricity arcing as being the pathway it travels, and we can think about the receiver receiving the electrical shock as you know, when it becomes an incident, when it, when it is an issue. If we put fatigue on that same model, we can think about the source of fatigue as basically work that's occurring. So is it due to scheduling? Is it due to the work that we're doing? The work itself is creating a hazard of fatigue. We can think about the pathway as the way in which it can be managed. When we recognize fatigue is occurring and we see that people are becoming tired, what do we have in place to be able to manage it? And then of course, when we look at it at the receiver, there's really two different ways that fatigue becomes an issue. It can be directly from the work that it's occurring, or maybe it's fatigue issues that were brought to the workplace in the first place. Um, you know, a long commute to get there, a long night, didn't sleep the night before. 
When we look at managing it, if we look at managing at the source, we're really looking at things that you can do, um, either project managing or within an organization. So for example, um, Brigitte sent me your uh, uh, field duty uh, guide, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are some things in place to be able to manage it at that larger organizational level. When you look at managing it along the path, it really comes to raising awareness within the organization. So <coughs> things like what we're doing right now, making people aware that if someone says, I'm really tired, you don't just go, <laughs> too bad. You really recognize that that could be, have an impact on their safety. And then when we look at it in terms of ourselves managing our own personal fatigue, again, part of it is education and recognizing those strategies that we can use. Okay, so we'll start off, we sort of looked big picture at organizational con controls, and I don't go into that very much because you guys have things in place. Um, but I thought we could look at team controls. So is there situations when you're working as a group that you can kind of look out for each other? Does that happen often in your work, in the field work, or is it always sort of on your own? Usually groups? So group, group works, okay. So when you're working together as a group, you can do a lot of that cross-checking to really keep each other safe, especially when you're working in, you know, uh, through the night or when you're working really long hours. Um, some of that is that interaction, that cross-checking. How are you doing over there? You know, how's it going? Um, <coughs> taking breaks when you see sort of the whole group is really starting to drag and people are starting to make mistakes. That's a great time to stop, take a break, sort of get everybody back on track changing routines to keep it interesting so it doesn't become monotonous, and planning your work. So we talked a little bit about circadian rhythms. When you're planning field work, not always possible, but when it is possible, planning anything that's a little bit more safety sensitive during times of circadian highs versus circadian lows. So not planning something really safety sensitive at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or at 4 o'clock in the morning, if it can be helped. Communicating fatigue. So that ability to know that when you're tired, you actually let the group know that you're tired so that everyone's sort of keeping an eye on things. Um, changing, rotating tasks, um, and also some of that cross-training. So if Joe comes to work and he's really tired, he was up all night um, for whatever reason, well, if you've got some cross-training going on, you can take him off of something that's pretty safety sensitive and put someone else. Or maybe he's just not the one that drives that day. And really just in general watching out for each other, recognizing fatigue as a hazard and really trying to put systems in place so that it doesn't become an issue. Okay, and for the next little bit, we'll talk about personal strategies, <clears throat> things that you can use to manage your own fatigue. And I'll start off with the first question, true or false? The only <coughs> way to cure fatigue is through sleep. What do you think? Yes, no? Yeah, when we're talking fatigue, not drowsiness, <clears throat> when we're talking fatigue, it is true. In the long run, only sleep will actually cure your fatigue. And we touched a little bit on this concept, but I want to come back to it, and that is the concept of sleep debt. So most of us typically <coughs> don't skip a whole night's sleep. What happens to most of us is we don't get quite as much sleep as we needed on Monday. And on Tuesday, again, maybe we got an hour or two less than we really needed. And same thing on Wednesday and Thursday, until by the time we get to Friday, we've developed a sleep debt. And that sleep debt can impair us just as much as having missed a whole night's sleep. That one short video clip that I showed, they talked about the fact that those that were getting six hours excuse me, after two, two weeks were as impaired as someone who'd missed a whole night's sleep. The other thing to note when it comes to recognizing sleep and sleep debt is that age makes a difference. As we age, we tend to get less stage three and four sleep and less REM. We're also not able to sleep in as long a stretch as we used to be able to. So sometime around the age of 30, things really begin to shift, and actually right around 40, we really notice a difference. Um, we can't always sleep in that full stretch. 
So because we're not always able to get our sleep as much as we want, we have to put other strategies. That idea about old people needing less sleep, not true. That's right. They don't, it's not that they need less sleep. They just can't get it all in one track. So quite often they have to introduce other strategies. And one of the best other strategies, yeah, naps. Okay, hands up. Who naps on a fairly regular basis? Who actually naps? Really? Wow, you guys are really low in the nap ratio. Let me try one more time. Who naps on a regular basis? Yeah, yeah. Who can take it? I'm not talking at lunch every day. <laughs> on a weekend, throughout a week, just, you know, who naps? Wow. Okay, you guys really need me. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> All right. Honestly, I think that's the lowest ratio I've ever seen. <laughs> okay, NASA has some great research in terms of napping. Um, yes, he is. Although we can really hopefully assume there's a co-pilot that's not napping at the time. <laughs> they can do that stuff. So they did a bunch of research. Actually, I'm trying to remember now. I think it's back in like the 70s. Um, and they've done some since. And basically what they did is they looked at pilots who were taking in-flight naps <coughs> with the assumably co-pilot running the show, um, and they measured their performance. And they found that those who were able to take the naps, especially on the longer trips, had about a 34% increase in overall performance capacity, uh, a 54% increase in alertness. They also had improved abilities to make decisions. Um, oh, and I forgot to, yeah, I like that one. Now, NASA, in their typical way, got it down to a science, and they had what they termed a 26-minute NASA nap. Not 25, not 30, 26 minutes. Now, I'm not saying you have to nap exactly 26 minutes, but there is something to that. You want to keep your naps under 30 minutes. Why? Back to that sleep cycles. So if you keep your nap under 30 minutes, you're only going into a stage one and two sleep. You're gonna wake up, you're gonna be pretty alert, ready to go, and you've restored yourself in terms of your alertness and your mental abilities. Now if you're exhausted, if you're really sleep deprived, and you need longer than that, then you should go for around a 90 minute to 120 minute nap. Why? Again, now you're going through all of the sleep stages through a complete sleep cycle. And you're going to end up back at that stage one and two, and you're going to be alert, and you're going to be ready to go. The never, never in the napping world, the what you don't want to do, is you don't want to try and nap between 45 minutes to an hour <coughs> and set an alarm clock or have someone come and wake you up. Because chances are you're going to be right in the middle of a stage three and four sleep and then you're gonna feel awful and achy and take forever to wake up and wish you hadn't even bothered. The other thing about napping, you wanna nap in your circadian lows. The best nap you're gonna get is between one to three in the afternoon. Or if you're you know, working nights and sleeping slash napping in the day, your best nap is between two to five in the morning. One short nap, 10 to 15 minutes, <clears throat> maximum and, and actually it says 30 minutes but really you don't want to actually be sleeping more than about 25 um, so that gives you kind of that five minute window to fall asleep um, a short nap is easily an hour's worth of skipped sleep and if you are working nights having trouble sleeping through the night or if you were answering yes to those first seven questions that we had earlier you should have a napping strategy you should have some way of paying back that sleep debt. Because, you know, sleep debt's like any other debt. The only way to really get rid of it is to pay it back. Um, and thinking in terms of, you know, maybe we can't nap in the middle of the day, but thinking sort of pre-shift before you start work um, or before in the field you're doing your work, late nights, etc. The other thing that's important to think about when we think about fatigue and sleep is recognizing sleep disorders. Sleep disorders impact at least 15% of the population. And in fact, when you look at certain age groups, for example, men over 45, that ratio goes up to as high as 25%, which is really quite high. 
there's different types of sleep disorders, but one of the ways, yeah? Before you go on sleep disorders, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. <laughs> as far as napping, like if that's only necessary, if you're getting normal nights of sleep and you're totally deprived, it doesn't really add anything, or, or does it? So if you're getting a regular night's sleep, if you're getting seven to eight hours sleep and you are good to go every day, you don't need napping, right? You're getting your sleep in your one long stretch, which is all that you need. Napping only comes in if you're creating a sleep debt. So whatever you're doing, whether it's sleep disorder, um, not getting enough sleep for stress, for you know whatever your issue is. Maybe it's your age, maybe it's the work you're doing, maybe you're working in the field. When you're creating that sleep debt, that's when you should be bringing in napping strategies. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. One sleep order, sleep disorder uh, I want to touch on is um, uh, sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea is, in essence, when the back of your tongue begins to relax too much in your sleep and it begins to block your airways. And you know someone who has sleep apnea if you ever hear them sleep because they tend to be really loud snorers, yeah, and then they sort of do that and they stop breathing and then they gasp, right? They're like, and then they go back to their snoring. And they'll do that sometimes hundreds of times in a night. People with uh, sleep apnea don't always know they have sleep apnea, except that they're always exhausted. Um, and if they have someone who hears them sleep, that person can let them know as well. Um, snoring, stopping breathing. Um, screening for sleep apnea can be fairly quick. Um, you can go through your doctor. Sometimes there's sleep clinics that will <coughs> assess that for you. Um, and there is treatment for it. It's normally a breathing device that you wear at night which isn't always the best, but most people with it say that it's much better than the alternative of always being exhausted, being that sort of sleeping zombie. The other thing to think about if you're having trouble keeping a regular schedule, um, or especially when you're working nights and, and sleeping days are shifting around, um, one of the things that can help you get to sleep if you're struggling with it is recognizing light cues. So you don't want to have bright lights right before you go to bed. If you go into the bathroom to brush your teeth and you could just about land an airplane, it's so bright, um, you're giving mixed messages to your brain. You're saying, wake up, wake up, and then you finish brushing your teeth and it's like, okay, I want to go to sleep. So that can be a real issue, sort of really minimizing your, your light cues right before you want to go to sleep. Thinking about screen time, um, TVs, computers, all of those give off a spectrum of light that tends to make us more awake. And you can switch that. There's apps you can get or ways you can switch in your computer, but recognizing you don't want the full-on bright light when you're trying to go to sleep. <coughs> Reading in lower light is a great strategy for trying to get yourself to sleep, uh, as well as giving yourself lots of light exposure in the morning. So again, that sort of hard reset of your circadians can help you get to sleep at night. And thinking about that blue spectrum light that you can use in the winter. One of the other things that I do in my work, I sort of have two separate things. Um, one is, of course, talking about fatigue and fatigue management, but I also um, sort of interrelated and separately talk about stress and stress management. And this is just a model that I use to look at all of the things that contribute to our stress, and then we can sort of use that model again to think about ways of controlling our stress. So just very briefly, when we look at stress, <coughs> our stress is caused by three things. It's caused by the situation itself. It's caused by our perception of the situation, because two people can encounter the same situation and you know, have different perceptions of it. And it's caused by our, what we perceive as our available resources to deal with that stress. And so when we look at controlling our stress, we can look at each of those three aspects and think about ways of minimizing situations that are going to cause us stress, ways of altering our perceptions to not view certain things as always stressful, or at least as manageable stress, um, and also increasing our resources in terms of our abilities, having big social networks or, or different skills to be able to deal with certain stresses. I'll give you a quick um, perception trick that I use, for example. Um, I use the worst case scenario as a way of really cross-checking myself in terms of perceptions. So. This morning, we're on our third computer, and we're trying to get it loaded, and, you know, I could be really stressed about such things. But I just sort of think, worst case scenario, 
Okay, worst case scenario, we're a few minutes late, maybe I have to like totally wing this presentation without any visuals. The world goes on. My family's okay, I'm okay, it's a first world problem if ever there was. You keep your stress in mind, right? The other thing we can think about um, sort of once we have our overall stress determined by the situations, our perceptions, and what we think of as our resources to deal with it is how we react to that stress. And really, we react to stress in three different ways. We react in terms of our behavior. Do you go for a run, or do you have a drink, or do you do both? <laughs> and Sorry we. It is, yeah. I typically, you do one and then the other, and you know, it's up to you. Do you react? In, we react in terms of our overall physiology. So our heart rate and our blood pressure and all of those things change as a result of our stress. Um, and there are things that we can do to sort of help alter that, uh, as well as exercise. And we react in terms of our emotional and our psychological responses. So do we view a stressful situation as maybe really empowering and motivating and, all right, I feel it, but this is going to be great? Or is it something that's overwhelming and debilitating and, and really bringing us down? Other strategies that we can look at in terms of managing our fatigue, aside from managing stress, is caffeine. I had a few people give me the caffeine cheers this morning, like, yes, I know fatigue management, I have coffee. <laughs> um, caffeine can be effective. We know it, we feel it. Um, but it really, and I'm sorry, that zoomed in a little much. It really only works for minor fatigue, so, um, and, it, and basically drowsiness. So caffeine's great if you're drowsy. If you're a little bit fatigued, it'll help pick you up. Um, but it won't work if you've been on the go for 36 hours straight and you have a long drive ahead of you. You can't down a cup of coffee and think it's going to work. Less is more. Caffeine, by definition, is addictive, so people who drink coffee all day every day aren't really going to be helped by that extra cup that they have at 2 in the afternoon when they want to pick me up. It takes about 20 minutes to kick in, uh, and I'll talk in a minute about a good strategy that you can use based on that recognizing it's going to take about 20 minutes to kick in. Caffeine lasts for about uh, five hours. It has a half-life of about five hours, and uh, it can have a downside. So um, when, uh, when we drink too much coffee, it tends to dehydrate us. It tends to take some of the minerals out. So if you drink a lot of coffee, you should do things like take calcium um, and drink lots of extra water. <coughs> How much caffeine? Well, it really depends on what you're drinking. So sort of a pick your poison. Um, Starbucks has a little more caffeine than the average. I note that because I, I don't drink Starbucks on a regular basis, and when I do have Starbucks, I kind of get that little bit of jittery. I had hotel coffee this morning, and I was kind of vibrating for about the first hour. Um, and, uh, oh, see, I've got Tim Hortons up there. Did I just make myself Canadian or what? <laughs> um, also taking a look at some of your energy drinks. Um, these tend to be really based on your age demographic, people under 25 energy drinks, people over 25, coffee. Um, Red Bull, not actually as high a caffeine as you'd think, but that monster energy drink has really high caffeine. And this five hour energy, that's the one that we really point our fingers to and say, not safe. Um, it's got about 200 milligrams of caffeine in about uh, five ounces of liquid. You down one of those and you are skyrocketing your caffeine levels. So it can really bring on like heart palpitations and some, some issues with that. And especially when people mix it with alcohol. And it gets to be quite, yeah, I know, nasty. Okay, you guys ready for another quick little <coughs> video? Oh, wait, just a sec. This is your brain on coffee. With its stimulating effects, it's easy to understand why coffee is the second most traded commodity on Earth after oil. For many, it keeps us awake and moving through our busy days. But how does it work? What exactly does coffee do to your brain? Whenever you're awake, a chemical called adenosine slowly accumulates in your brain. And this adenosine binds to receptors which slow down brain activity. Ultimately, the more adenosine there is, the more tired your brain feels. Which makes sense, as the longer you're awake, the more fatigued you become. Conversely, while you sleep, the concentration of adenosine declines, gradually promoting wakefulness. But it turns out that the caffeine in your coffee is incredibly similar to adenosine in structure. The caffeine works its way through your bloodstream and into your brain, where it starts to compete and binds with the 
adenosine receptors. But because it's not adenosine, the sleepiness effect isn't felt. Adenosine can no longer bind, meaning its calming properties are diminished, which is great for you when you're feeling tired. However, with long-term use of caffeine, your brain responds by creating more adenosine receptors, which means more caffeine is required to elicit the same response. It also means that when you try to quit drinking coffee or miss your daily intake, you might experience some withdrawal symptoms and feel more tired than you would have before you ever drank coffee. But the caffeine doesn't stop there. It also stimulates the production of adrenaline, you know, the fight or flight hormone. This increases your heart rate, gets your blood pumping, and even opens up your airways. <coughs> Furthermore, it affects dopamine levels by preventing its reabsorption in the brain, which makes you feel happy. In fact, this is the exact same thing that cocaine does, just to a lesser degree. It's a drug after all. This dopamine stimulation is also the aspect of coffee that makes it moderately addictive. Caffeine also has a half-life of around six hours, so if you drank a standard coffee with around 150 milligrams of caffeine, after about six hours, there'll only be 75 milligrams left in your system, and you'll be feeling half of the effect. And six hours after that, you'll have 37.5 milligrams, leaving more room for adenosine to jump back into action, which is why you may reach for another cup throughout the day to maintain that glorious, alert, and energetic feeling. So drink up and enjoy the buzz while it lasts. I know they say six hours in there, but my research all said five, so I stick with that number for the half-life. Okay, aside from our lovely dose of caffeine, uh, some of the other things we can do to manage our personal fatigue is exercise. Um, the more fit we are, the more we're better able to manage a lot of stresses in life, including fatigue. I like this model of exercise because often we tend to think of exercise as a I exercise or I don't exercise, like it's an all or nothing proposition. And really, I think this does a great job, this pyramid of showing, um, you know, it starts with that just getting more and more active every day. You can work your way up the pyramid in terms of getting, you know, more cardiovascular exercise two to three times, sorry, three to five times a week getting into your strength and flexibility training, incorporating it into your uh, leisure activities, and just, for the most part, reducing the time that we sit. And I know that that's often easier said than done in terms of reducing time that we sit, but just recognizing that uh, it has an impact. The other thing that we can do in terms of managing our fatigue is recognizing uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of our blood sugar levels. So being tired tends to really impact our blood sugar levels which impacts us how we feel emotionally and physically, but we can control that. We can control that to some degree by looking at the glycemic index of the food that we eat. So if we eat food that is high glycemic index, it shoots our blood sugar levels up really quickly, but it drops them just as quickly. And when we eat foods that are lower glycemic index, they tend to raise our blood sugar levels slowly, keep them fairly even, and then drop them slowly. The good news, of course, is that foods that are uh, low glycemic index are healthier choices anyways. Whole foods, whole fruits, whole vegetables, milk and dairy products, low-fat proteins, um, as well, uh, you know, and avoiding those higher glycemic index. The bad news <coughs> is that when we're super tired, we crave the high glycemic index foods because our blood sugars are irre irregular, so we want to shoot them up because we feel that low. So... If you're really tired and you're craving that, you know, starchy, sugary food to kind of bring your sugars up, at least pair it with a low glycemic food. So that maybe you get that quick shoot up of blood sugars, but you also can get some of that evening off effect so that you don't have those blood sugars jumping all over the place. The one to avoid when we're super tired, especially if, um, you know, you have to do anything like driving or anything else that's safety sensitive, you want to, I know, I did that on purpose. <laughs> it does look like a great burger. Um, but you want to avoid that. Um, I touched a little bit on the fact that, you know, I, I do lots of traveling and driving. When I'm driving late at night, guess what's always available anywhere I go? They don't look like that. No, they don't. <laughs> You're right. The picture on the sign does, but the yeah. thing I get when I go through the drive-thru is not that burger. Yeah. But, I mean, I know it's, you know, a counterculture or stupid like. <laughs> I know this may be something that, like, is sort of countercultural, but the thing is that, like, fats and proteins are what keep you going long term. So if the only thing you eat is sugar, which is the only thing you had in that other that thing, you're going to crash and burn every like you know half hour or something. So you have to have this kind of stuff in order to keep going. Otherwise, you will you know, spike your, your glycemic index. 
Yeah, and I'm not talking about this in terms of a protein source. Low-fat po proteins are great. They fall under basically your low glycemic index foods in terms of their ability to really stabilize your blood sugars. The reason this is not a good choice is because it's full of fat. And so the high fat content takes a lot of your body's energy to be able to digest it. And when all of your body's energy is going to digest it, you become very tired. So it's the reason we all fall asleep after the big turkey dinner. It's because we've, it's not really um, the, the turkey that does, no, it's not the tryptophan. It's your high fat content. And all your body is going to digest it and it'll make you sleepy. I'm not saying don't ever eat that burger. <laughs> I'm just saying don't eat it if you're on a drive or doing something that you need to be awake and alert for. Okay, so quick note, and we're kind of running to the end of time, so maybe I won't, I'll just maybe take one quick one. What strategies work for you? The ones I've talked about or something different? Who's got some good strategies they want to share? One. I'm going to hold till I get one. One good strategy. Yeah. Uh, oh, Mike, sorry. <laughs> you forgot about that when you volunteered, didn't you? <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, so. Um, I, I try to take 20 minute power naps when I'm driving. Uh, yeah. um, if I'm tired. Pulling, <laughs> pulling over first, though, right? <laughs> well, well I, I, have, I have fallen asleep at the wheel well, back in the past, and uh, I had yeah. a horrific auto accident because of that. Yeah. Um, so. It, you become more cognizant, and then uh, you know when I when I find myself being drowsy, I'll, I'll take a 20-minute power nap, and, and, and you're good for usually a couple of three hours. Yeah, excellent strategy. Thank you for sharing that. I am a huge believer in the pullover and take your 20-minute nap. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, hang on. I'm going to go back to yeah, one. Me. <laughs> I want to share one quick strategy. Honestly, the best one I've ever heard I was in this really remote like way up in the Yukon by Alaska northern northern mining site and this one worker said I have the best strategy ever this guy stands up he's like I don't know 60 if he's a day and he had one of those super long comb overs you know where if we have the hair really long it sort of covers right over he says just take my hair he says I wind it into the window do the window up guaranteed I wake up every time <laughs> Oh, I could not keep a straight face. I admit it. <laughs> it was honestly the best one I've ever heard. <laughs> I am going to end um, in terms of personal strategies. I do want to end talking about exactly what you talked about, and that is driving. It's where a lot of us face the biggest risk in terms of fatigue. When you're driving, first step, if at all possible, eliminate it. Eliminate the hazard entirely. Be well rested. Take a nap if you can. Don't be driving tired. But if situations persist, um, you guys are chasing a storm and you don't want to pull over, you can't quite, you know, pull over, take a break, get out of the vehicle, at least reduce it if you can. If you are at the stage where you're just temporarily holding it off, you're shifting, you're opening the window, you're putting your hair in the window, <laughs> you're, you're doing everything to stay awake, really recognize that it is so short term. Your time to be able to be safe is very limited and you won't necessarily have warning when that micro sleep comes on you. You just don't want to end up that guy, you know, died peacefully in his sleep, which is sad and ironic. I'm going to share one quick video and one quick story with you before we finish up here. All right, I like this video, so. Up to 300 people are killed every year in accidents where the driver has fallen asleep at the wheel. Before you feel too tired, pull off the road into a services or other safe area. Drink some strong coffee and take a quick nap while the caffeine kicks in. If you're having a nap, you've left your lights on, sir. Alright, cheers. Think. Don't drive tired. I didn't want something horrible and graphic at the end, but I think that's a good, a good way of sort of pointing it out. And that idea of having a, downing a cup of coffee and then taking your 20 minute nap is sort of a time proven strategy. Um, it's kind of even builds on that, that just take a nap because the caffeine takes about 20 minutes to kick in. So when you do wake up, oh, the adrenaline's going and you're good to go. Um, and one final story I just want to share with you. This uh, actually is the same mining camp I was talking about earlier. 
Um, and it is where I really became quite passionate on the idea of fatigue and fatigue management. Um, I was up at this mine, and one of the work uh, pieces of work that I was doing was going from uh, different areas of the mine, assessing their risk in terms of fatigue. And this particular area of the mine was an open pit mine, and it had every fatigue risk factor going. They had, um, you know, extreme temperatures um, <clears throat> with the short nights and, and longer days, depending on the time of year. They had. Uh, they were driving around and around in an open pit mine, so you can just imagine how exciting and monotonous that would be. Um, they had heavy duty and light duty equipment using the same service roads, which is hugely dangerous, um, and they just used radio calls to be able to coordinate that, so again, you had to be alert. And, you know, I can go on and on, but despite having every risk factor going, this particular area of the mine had one of the lowest incidents. And so at first I was a little bit confused and I started asking some questions and doing some investigation. And what I discovered is that the manager at this area had had his own incident with regards to fatigue and he was super aware. He talked to the people who worked there on a regular basis. They'd have safety meetings and he would talk about fatigue. And even though the company did not have anything official in terms of a policy, they had an unspoken policy in this area of the mine that if you were tired, you radioed in that you were taking your 20-minute break, you pulled over, you had a nap, and then you radioed when you were back. <coughs> and I think the fact that they had those strategies in place, even if they weren't officially recognized, was the biggest reason they had every risk factor going, but really low incident rates. And we have finished our time, both figuratively and literally, and uh, I'd like to just, if we have a few minutes, uh, take some questions. Yeah. So you're advocating break rooms with places to nap? Uh, do you know what? I personally do. Um, there's always that fear, and I don't, you know, it's, it's, if somehow if we set up a place for people to nap, everybody's going to be napping all the time, nobody's going to be getting any work done, but, you know, think of it in terms of sick days, right? We don't take advantage of sick days, and people who take advantage of those types of systems are going to be taking advantage everywhere. I really do advocate places to go to have a rest, um, and especially when you're in an environment, especially in the field, where you're working those longer hours and maybe you're not used to those hours, they're not what you're accustomed to, which has a huge impact on your fatigue. I'm a big believer that we should manage it and we should manage it effectively in the workplace. So yeah, I do. I totally advocate that. But it's that perception you've got to get past, right? And that's often your biggest barrier. So yeah. Speaking of that, how many companies that you work at have actually implemented? So to repeat for yeah. those benefit of those who are following us online, how many companies that you worked with have actually implemented the, the break rooms, nap rooms? It depends on the industry. And it depends on the size of the organization. So, healthcare, they're pretty good. Mind you, they're ridiculous in terms of the fatigue. They need nap rooms. Um, but they have things <coughs> like break rooms and nap rooms. Um, larger organizations, um, those that are very aware and safety conscious, they are also more likely to have the ability to have places for people to go and rest. But, I, you know, I work in organizations that run 24-hour schedules. Um, I was working with Dow Chemical uh, three months ago. And they have a control room with people to trade off. And, and there's, you know, those controllers have to be awake. They're monitoring things that are going on in that chemical plant. But they wouldn't officially allow naps. So what happened is, unofficially, the guys would trade off and take a nap. They're working shift work. They're working through the night. They're exhausted. But it was always that almost someone on guard at the door because it wasn't officially allowed. Um, the biggest way that that changes is influencing the culture. So education and awareness. It almost in no other hazard is education and awareness such a critical part in being able to change it. And um, with that particular group, I started, I was brought in, it was a really nice bottom-up scenario. I was brought in to talk to the shift workers, just shift worker training on fatigue. 
um, and the movement began as the information circulated and that awareness grew and um, a lot of requests were made to have me talk further up the chain and so I presented to middle management and then I presented to senior leadership and by the end this particular plant was in full on discussion for putting in a break room or allowing napping on the job. So. Is it there? No, not nearly to the level it should be. But is it coming? Yes. Um, when I first started talking fatigue management, uh, people would look at me like I had two heads. <clears throat> and more and more, I'm getting the, oh yeah, yeah, we recognize it as an issue. We still don't know how to deal with it, but we recognize it. So we're moving, we're improving. <clears throat> and most of the fatigue management that's occurred throughout industry uh, is really within the last 10 years. A lot of companies, their policies have just come into place in the last three. So we're getting there. Yeah. Maybe I should leave the room so they can ask questions. I, I don't know. I'm surprised. Nobody wants to know about dreaming, sleeping. I always get a few on that. Guess not. Guess not. All right. I'm here for a little bit, so if you want a one-on-one -on -one question, I'm totally good to do that too. So thanks, guys. I appreciate it.